All right. Well, good morning. Um, this is about the fourth or fifth time that uh, Ben and I have gone through and, and presented to different Java Light groups. Um, yesterday, we presented to all of the ETAC group. That includes our TINET group, which is our coaches, network managers, tech directors. Today, after this meeting, we'll be meeting with online and blended learning folks. Um, you guys next. Yesterday, we had over 100 unique individuals that uh, were a part of the release. Today, it looks like we're at over 60. I would imagine by the end of the day today, we'll be over 200 individuals who have been uh, part of the release party, if you will, if you can call it that. We have to have some levity uh, of the uh, Learn On Learning Portal. To give you some back context, and um, it, I think it's important to understand that, that since there's a broad demographic of people in the room right now, um, you might not all have the same context of where this all came from. Certainly, we all know the situation we're in, but we also have to recognize the work that our superintendent group has been doing. Um, as early as last week, um, last, it seems like, Brad, it was uh, an eternity ago, doesn't it? Uh, Monday of last week, we were uh, just taking part in the very first face-to-face uh, -face meeting, I might add, of about 200 safe schools personnel up in Cumberland County, where the premise of even thinking about this could have been first sparked. And shortly after that, Tuesday, by Tuesday afternoon, all the superintendents came together face to face, some virtual um, at the IU and started working on a plan. And when I say started working on the plan, not that you individually as districts didn't have plans in place. What I'm talking about is I have never seen in my 15 years of administrative leadership, I have never seen um, the level of um, coordination and collaboration and collegiality um, that has existed. Nothing has brought um, all of our unique schools and districts together more than the leadership that we all know we're going to need to have over these next weeks, months, however long it's going to be. And so um, in that spirit, um, on Sunday afternoon, we had a superintendent's meeting and we uh, approached them from the perspective of needs. What are the things that they felt that their staff, you guys as leaders, were going to need most? And the continuum was all over the board, but I think what <clears throat> the general consensus was, was that there needed to be a rapid cycle of giving the resources that teachers were going to need to get content online and parents the resources for being able to allow their children to be able to access it. In addition, we heard loud and clear that leaders needed to be able to have some formal plan. Now, with that said, we work very closely with each of you um, to be able to develop long-term plans often uh, with this. We have districts that have been moving to online instruction for the last three to five years and still are not where they would like to be to be able to say they could seamlessly um, move right over to that environment. So what you're going to see here today is what Ben and I decided right away when we met then on Sunday evening to start talking about a plan, we knew we needed to get something that was actually accessible, was quick, and was the really hitting the majority of our teachers uh, with resources where they, um, that where they were. And so uh, born out of this was Learn On. This site that you're gonna see here did not exist as of about nine o'clock on Monday morning. So what you're seeing was what we've developed all this week, and it is a continually evolving portal. It has turned into that, a, a real portal. And so I want to point out a couple of things, and Ben, feel free to jump in. I know we've done this uh, several times now, but if I miss something or if I forget something, just jump in and, and stop me. Um, if you look, you'll see that the portal is based around the three demographics I've de just described. Once we officially launch, which uh, I have to tell you, as of uh, this morning, we had over 700 unique um, users who have already accessed the site, and we saw that it was over 20 states in, in the U.S. that have actually started accessing it. So I think it already is kind of going live. Um, we have, right on the top landing page, scheduled a series of two full weeks of training webinars that as your staff are home and as they are trying to figure out what are the best practices, as your leaders are trying to figure out how do we guide this, we have scheduled and set up a full continuum of professional learning opportunities partnering with our, our friends here in Ed Services as well as in Special Ed 
you're going to notice these office hours over the next couple of days are going to fill in with sessions as well. Our TAC folks are going to be um, putting in some sessions that are going to be very pragmatic for your staff as well. Over three, as we, as we go down through, you'll see here that we're going to be using Zoom for these trainings and they're going to be supported by the content that I'm going to get to in a minute up top here. These sessions are able to hold 3,000 attendees. So we hope that that's gonna be enough. We have 10,000 educators or more across just our IU footprint, but we think that that's gonna allow us to be able to meet the capacity that we're, that we're going to try to meet. And if they missed it, or if the room is full, they can go to our YouTube channel where everything will be there, fully accessible and closed captioned. In addition, we will be taking care of reporting even Act 48. We realize that these are timelines that are coming up. So we're gonna be accepting at the end of every webinar, if the attendee stays all the way to the end, they're gonna get um, immediately redirected out of the webinar and to our Act 48 reporting system where we're gonna be able to take care of that. We're also creating an FAQ where it's essentially our instructional question help desk where your teachers, your leaders can post questions, and then we'll be creating an FAQ knowledge base that all of our users can go to. As we go into next week, this calendar was built, and I realize a lot of you may be saying, I need some training for my teachers now, not the, the Monday from next Monday. I'm gonna share with you that this date was collaboratively determined with the superintendent group from all three counties. While some of your groups and your teachers may be there and ready, not all are. So we are only going to begin launching these actual live webinars with staff in mind, teaching staff in mind, starting on the 30th. That's why we were able to fill all next week with talking to the Special Ed Advisory Council, just like we are with you today, as well as with the leadership by scheduling down here in the leadership meeting scheduler. We're using Calendly as a tool for this. You can see that all the dates are available. So if next week you wanna meet with us on the 25th, you'll see here are some available times. You see people are already booking up on the 24th, only three of the six time slots are available. So if there's things you wanna meet with us about to talk through just what some of your plans are, that's where would be a great place to sign up for that. So speaking about your plans, what should be driving your plans? That's what really we wanna spend the bulk of the rest of our time with you today going over. But before I do that, Ben, did I miss anything or am I good to go? Nope, I think you covered everything there. Okay, so we tried to make it a very URL friendly web address. When you go to uh, the normal site, it's pretty long. And you know what? I don't know about you guys, but I'm just about sick and tired of typing COVID-19 into stuff. So we got rid of it. We had it as the name of our site and we're like, I'm done. And so it is now in the chat. It is learn on iu12.org. Yes, it is pronounced learn on, not learning. So please help us with that branding and make sure that it is learn, pause, on. And when you go to learn on, you'll see in the district, we're going to break this down. Ben's going to take care of talking about the educator portal, and I'm going to talk about the district leaders. And then um, probably Ben will tag, you know, will tag the parent and caregivers on to finishing up after the educators. What you'll notice is that we have made this very stage and step based. When you go into any of the resources that we're providing, and I think one of the things that Ben probably um, shared uh, with, with a lot of groups is that um, we are looking at a resource that is intended to get districts spun up as quickly as is even possible. And so in doing that, I'm going to go to the first page, which is on operationalizing. Actually, before I even, ever even do that, I want to go to the narrative that we have right on the district leaders page. I cannot stress the importance of this paragraph. In fact, it's so important, I'm actually going to pause and let you read it. So it's worth mentioning this second time. We're gonna do our best here. We're gonna do everything. And when I say we, I mean the collective we. But we realize if we had three years to build out a blended and online learning conversion, 
<laughs> we wouldn't necessarily be doing things in the way that we are. What we're trying to do to operationalize is to get people spun up as quickly as possible. So from the leadership perspective, this is as I am as an educational technology leader, looking at our own organization, these are the five major steps that I see as essential in going through and building out your plan. We're not gonna go through all of them. I'm gonna go through the first one. You can look at the others and then schedule office hours with us if you have questions going forward. We just don't have enough time. We'd spend the entire time going over um, the, your entire CC rep time going over the learn portal. So I'm gonna go into operational steps just as an example. You'll see that the first thing when determining your operational steps is defining your expectations across these four stakeholder groups. You can decide how you would like to adapt these, but at the end of the day, without expectations of staff and without expectation of students, it's gonna be challenging to then define your other steps moving forward. So within each of these, what we call phases, so these are the phases, operationalizing, preparing, mobilizing, converting, and deploying. You're gonna see very succinct steps that can be blown out so that you can see exactly how big each of them are once we go in. So as an example here, as we come through, I would also point out, if you remember Brad talked about PAIU putting together a toolkit, some of the resources you'll see in here, as an example, these expectations are put out from the entire PAIU group that devised what expectations would need to be established among stakeholder groups. So as an example, if you're in step one of operationalizing, you may not have a telework policy for your staff. You might not have even have thought about it. You might not even know where to get one. Now you do. We put a staff telework policy in here for you. We tried to think about the things you needed to think about before you even knew you needed to think about them. Web conferencing technology. Certainly we're talking about FERPA, we're talking about HIPAA, and we wanna make sure that we are secure with the content that we are actually doing. And so we put in there, what are the considerations for FERPA as you're having staff who may be delivering content now in a virtual environment that is face-to-face -face using something like Zoom or something like um, Google Hangouts Meet, both of which are FERPA compliant. And then finally, as we look at your own policies, you may not have a live streaming policy that's actually board adopted. It's probably too late at this point to get one adopted before you need to get moving. That's fine. Turn this policy into a student agreement that they have to sign off on electronically and acknowledge that they understand the parameters of what your district is ex expecting of them. So that's just one section of one step contained within the operationalizing phase. Every phase as we go down through here from operationalizing to converting, if I go to deploying, every one of them is broken into very nice succinct steps to lead you through this what we know is could be a very tumultuous times if you didn't have the guidance. We hope that by giving you this guidance of through these five steps of leadership, you can set up a really clear plan for your educators for what they need to do to be able to then access the educator stages. So I'm gonna pause there, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing so we can turn over to Ben. I've been looking in the chat, I haven't seen any questions yet come into the chat, please feel free to be typing any questions you have in there and um, I'll go ahead and take care of fielding those while Ben is taking over for the educator side of the portal. So on to you, Ben. Thanks, Jared. So I'm back on our homepage and we have two ways that educators can get to the site, uh, to the location that they're looking for. First, they can go to um, the educator button <clears throat> or they can come to the drop down and you'll see we're going to although we will be using our YouTube channel we'll also be posting the recorded webinars uh, right on the site and I'm going to start by clicking on the main button for educators and what you're going to see mirrors what Jared was discussing for district leaders which is that um, that we really want to make sure that um, that people have a step-by-step -step process that will allow them to um, move their instruction into an online place. And so 
that's going to begin by having them investigate best practices. So we've set up these steps for, for the educators. And again, it's very similar. They would go to the best practices page and they would be able to take a look at the different pieces that we have there. And in addition, ask those types of instructional questions that might apply. Then we want them to think about all of their learners. And as we recognize how important FAPE is, we have created special pages specifically for special ed, English learners, and gifted support. Please know that, um, as Jared said, you know, we really spun the majority of this up in, four, in, in about 48 hours. Um, on our roadmap is to create specific pages for specialized educators, such as school counselors, career to uh, works um, uh, advisors, nurses, reading specialists, all those types of things that's being done in the background so that we can also consider all of your educators. The next step is for the educator to think about their warehouse. And when we talk about the warehouse, we recognize that many of you have um, LMSs. You may have Canvas, Schoology, Google Classroom, or some combination of that. And, and one of the, the pieces that, that I think is important to note, um, and, and it will help you at least understand the philosophy we have in trying to get educators online. If you have Schoology and all of your educators are using it, then that becomes a great place for them to use it. But if, if, you, ha if you have not uh, already been using an LMS, then we don't feel like it's going to be easy for somebody to spin that up. Uh, if you, you know, I see lots of advice out there, oh, go use Google Classroom, it's very simple to use, and, um, and you won't have any issues um, in, in, in that regard um, for how, um, how to, to, to get information to students. And what we think is that, you know, if you had them face-to-face, -face, it's still a chore, uh, where you have to learn Google Classroom and then upload your materials and, and figure out where things go and how to access them and grading and all that. And then you have to get your students into that, that session. And so um, I would just point out that if that's not easy when they're face to face. If a teacher doesn't have that, that ability right now to um, employ their Google Classroom, I'm, we're not sure that that's the best strategy. And instead we're recommending the use of something simple, keeping it simple, a Google Doc or a HyperDoc. Um, uh, can really make it easy for them to sort of follow along and see all the different things um, that, that the teacher is planning. In the same way, we are recommending that districts create a directory for all of their educators. So that uh, if you're saying everything is in Schoology, that's where all, all teachers and students and families can access things, that's fine. But if not, creating a directory with a list of the the teacher names or the subject names will allow students to have, and parents, a one-stop shop to find those resources. So thinking about students that are in third, fifth, eighth grade, you know, for a parent, we don't want them going to three places. We want them going to one place where they can, um, they can make use of it. And so once you've made the decision about identifying your warehouse, the next step is to start the planning process. And we have selected the um, uh, Allison Yang's uh, Oreo format here. And you can see that we have a, a template that we've created that uh, builds off of her Oreo template. And, and I'll show you where you can get more information on that in a moment. But um, it's a, a, a daily planning tool. And what we've added is a UDL component to that. In addition, we've created a weekly overview document. And these documents you are able to make use of however you would want. Uh, so if you wanted to brand them for your district and adopt them, um, for consistency sake of having all educators use that, that's fine. And then the last uh, section is to consider the tools. And you'll notice that that comes after the teacher has started the planning process. And look, um, if, if your mailbox is like mine, you're getting hundreds of emails from uh, all these online tools saying we've gone free um, during this, this process. And that's fine. But one of the, th the considerations we had for this website is not to just list out a, a bunch of resources because we don't think that that's particularly helpful to educators because then they have to sort through and, and, and sift through everything. Now we do have some of those. So you'll see that 
when you go to our free online tools page and our online content page, there is a, a large list, but you don't really start looking for there until you've started the planning process and you think about, this is what I need to make this happen. So, um, so keeping those steps in mind, those five steps are, is really where we want to see educators uh, conduct their work. Now, I do want to point out a few other things that are in here. So one of which is considering all learners. So we have, um, we have worked with our PAIU job alike groups to pull the information in. I'm going to open up the special education learners. And what you'll see is a list of best practices and considerations. And again, this comes from the PAIU teams that are working on those guiding documents. Then we have created a step-by-step -step process for what to do and think about from an educator point of view regarding um, working with your special education students. You will find in the sections that Jared talked about, guidance and, and information for district leaders that is separate and more targeted towards the leadership position for what you should be doing with um, uh, special education students and, and all of those students who are in this same category. And I just wanna emphasize when I go back to considerations for all learners that what FAPE is really telling us is if you're educating one, you have to educate all of your students. And, and so we wanna make sure that we have supports for both the specialized educators as well as the regular educators who have these students in their classes and are able to work with them. And again, for time's sake, I'm not gonna go through all the sections, but feel free to explore. And one of the other things I would mention is this is evolving. And, and so you will continue to see resources added there, but we're not gonna just dump them in. We're, we're trying to thoughtfully consider how we're adding things in. Ben, can I oh, just jump in a second? Sure. <clears throat> I would group even in the FAPE discussion, consideration for learners who don't have accessible resources like internet, like a home computer, or if they have a home computer, it's a family of three children who are all having to share the one desktop or maybe mom's iPhone. Um, I think those are, uh, are similar types of discussions. I will tell you one of the things um, yesterday, Ben, if you can go back to the home screen, we specifically broke out our ETAC group. If you go down to the schedule for me, Ben, and then roll up to yesterday, we broke down, we did the ETAC group first as a whole group. And that's where we had, we had over 65 people in that one meeting, district people, that wasn't even including IU staff. Then we ended up breaking out into the tech leaders, the Tynet group, and the network group. And then of course, Ben, or I'm sorry, Alan will be facilitating the online and blending learning group. In every one of those conversations, they are already starting to think about what things are gonna have to happen for those students who don't have access. Independent of a special needs or um, EL or any of those types of things. They were getting creative. I mean, they know that you guys are setting up, many of you, the lunch pickups. Well, what if it's curriculum pickup um, for those students who aren't um, able to get online. You're going to need to start thinking up. or equipment pickup. They're also starting to think about how they can spin up help desk services for kids if you have technology resources. So um, I will say it was a real, we had four hours of uh, essentially ETAC yesterday, which is probably more than anybody should be subjected to. But a lot of the discussions were around exactly that question. So I would strongly encourage you to um, talk with your tech folks keep them included because they had some really good ideas um, at, that are a part of the notes and the recording that I already put up in the, um, the chat for uh, this Zoom meeting. Thanks, Jared. So I, I do wanna um, take a, a few moments just to quickly highlight uh, a couple of our other tools that are in here. So when we think about free and online tools, um, this opening section is I think really critical for, uh, for educators to think about. When you, when you move from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual, start thinking about what it is that you actually do in the face-to-face -face environment. Um, a, lot of a lot of educators still use direct instruction. So what does this direct instruction look like when you move to virtual? Well, you could do a webinar. It could be synchronous or asynchronous. You could do a screencast. 
You could use Nearpod. There are other ways to do that that you can um, that you can make use of. <clears throat> And then you would say, okay, so I want to do a screencast. Well, what are the tools to do a screencast? And you could use things like Zoom or Screencastify or QuickTime Player. So this is <clears throat> what we've highlighted here is our philosophy on the use of the tools. So rather than saying, well, you know, this tool went free and we definitely want to um, use it, we want to make sure that everybody can, um, can access it. The, the other thing that we've done is we have worked with Who Knew It to give access to all of our educators. You'll see there's a generic uh, login and password, and who knew it provides bite-sized information um, in video format on how to use tools. So if you're thinking, okay, that's great, I wanna learn how to use Zoom, what you'll see is that you can go to our Zoom page and you can, you can learn about it, or you can use this login, and it has a whole suite of those online tools, so it'll make that, that um, education piece ramp up. The rest of our, our conversions are listed here that you can see for how you move from face-to-face -face instruction to online. And then for content resources, we also have done the same thing. We put the four core subject areas at the top, followed by other areas. And if you dive into any one of these specific areas, you'll find lots of information. And we've tried to identify for you whether it's free or such as OER Commons, which is always free or free during this, um, uh, this issue that we're dealing with now so that you understand when you make that choice, whether or not you're going to continue to have access uh, later on. And then the last thing I'll point out is that we have a glossary of uh, terms and acronyms that are being used on the website. So um, Jared has already um, covered this. I, I saw the one question. We will have the registration link coming soon. It's not going to be a requirement to register, but it will allow us to give, get information on a, about how many educators are planning to attend. And so that'll be uh, coming probably not until Tuesday of next week. That's our target to have the registration for the sessions that begin the following Monday. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jared to see if he has anything before he turns it back over to Brad and his team. Sure. So um, thank you, Ben. And um, Brad, if you want to go ahead and get back to your agenda, actually, you know what, just in case there's questions, why don't you let it uh, with me still? That way, if uh, somebody does have a question, I can I can field it. Um, as far as for the portal, I'll go ahead and uh, pull that back up again. Um, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us for sure. Um, but um, one of the questions that just came into the chat that I'll just quickly answer. Some of your tech directors are starting to work on plans of deploying devices, um, none of which are discussing um, yesterday in the entire discussion, the concern was not around the insurance element. Um, and in fact, the insurance cost is so inexpensive in comparison to the cost of the hardware itself. I would probably encourage you to just think about covering that for now and then dealing with it later if it's something that you have to contend with. But again, that's something you need to talk with your own tech folks about. I would say that that's the thing that I would um, say resonated most with every single one of the job-alike subgroups yesterday, and that's how I want to end, is please make sure that you are thinking about your coaches and thinking about your tech directors and thinking about your hardware specialists as you're going forward with your plans. It is essential. They have an expertise that is really unmatchable in terms of knowing the things, the pitfalls that many of your teachers are going to run into. And they will help you think through these things that I know can seem daunting right now. So please make sure that you include them. Every one of them wanted to um, absolutely try to make uh, a, a uh, impression on me to share that with every other leadership group that I worked with or had a chance to talk with. So I am sharing with you, please make sure that you include them. Um, ben, I don't know if you got to point to, I was fielding some of the questions. Did you get to talk about the parents side here? I didn't. So that's a good point. <clears throat> we, we recognize that for the parents um, and caregivers, and part of the reason why we talked about caregivers is that um, we don't think that it's a realistic expectation that you can put online learning, uh, just put some stuff on a website, have a kindergarten student go read all of that information, and then work through that list and submit all of their work. We recognize that, that what's going to happen is 
that most likely somebody else in the home, it may be a parent, but it may be the sixth grader who is going to be supporting those students. Um, and, and as Jared mentioned, you know, you think about one computer in a, in a household and um, mom and dad trying to work remotely and the kids trying to access it. So we put together uh, some information for those, those caregivers. And if Jared just scrolls down a little, you'll see there are tips for helping to learn your learner at home, but also the Common Sense news, uh, Newsletter, which um, is something that's typically kept under a, um, a walled garden, but they opened it up, actually gives um, a parent a nice little schedule that could be used throughout the day to support their learning. It, it sort of breaks it down and says, Here's, here would be op opportunities for physical education and where you would go and do that. And so that's a great resource, but we, we just put that information there to make sure that the, the parents and the caregivers also have that opportunity. All right, so we are getting the old hook and uh, rightfully so. I think that was, uh, I, that was, uh, I told Brad we would try to stay under 30 minutes, although I will point out I noticed the time we started and we are under 30 minutes. So <laughs> if there's questions, just reach out to us. Otherwise, thank you for your time today. And Brad, it's back to you. All right, thank you. Always competitive, Jared. Always competitive. I like that. Um, Jared and Ben, thank you guys so much. Um, there's been a ton of work on this and really all that work is meant to help you. Um, so as you digest what Jared and Ben had shared with you um, and you get to go through all of it, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, um, Jared, Ben, anybody in our team. Um, we want to definitely help you so that you can navigate this tool to make it work the best for you. So Jared and Ben, thank you again um, for joining us today. I really appreciate that.